SolarWinds MSP gives you a comprehensive, secure, and easy-to-use ITSM suite. Okay, that's the cool marketing speak that these folks put on there. By the way, this is not sponsored by SolarWinds. This is being told to you by a person who uses SolarWinds products. I am happy with them, but we're going to preface this a little bit. So what is an RMM tool? Well, our own tool fills that gap of the fact that, well, Microsoft doesn't do updates right. Anyone who's worked in IT for any length of time realizes that updates, security, antivirus is always like, it's a messy uh, best effort, as I call it. Security is still best effort. Um, there's always another hole. There's always another thing that has to be patched. And it's a cat and mouse game of back and forth. There's updates and everything else. And matter of fact, I'm giving this uh, video and recording it here on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2019, and Patch Tuesday was yesterday, which, of course, there's a, more patches and more problems that were solved. And let's get back to the point. So we know that Microsoft doesn't do it right. These are tools that fill that gap and try to add and enhance security. Now, all of the RMM tools out there, SolarWinds is the one we chose, and we've been using it for a number of years. But before someone starts writing their angry comment going, but it used to not be, I know, it was HoundDog.us, then it was GFI, then it was uh, now SolarWinds. And SolarWinds has acquired many companies. Matter of fact, inter interestingly enough, different products we had used have all been acquired by SolarWinds and conglomerated into one big system, which is actually not bad. And none of these are perfect. Uh, if I know anything from talking to a lot of other MSPs and other friends I have in IT, um, all these tools suck. <laughs> we'll start with that. There's none of them that are magical, that are automated into the point of they require no people to interact with them. Uh, bits because computers are complex, software is complex, and it's this combination of multiple layers of software that your clients have to run combined with Windows, which has so much legacy support and years of messy code that there's just a lot of issues you're going to run into. So none of these are perfect. I know someone's going to leave in the comments like, oh, but you haven't tried this one, Tom. This is that magic bullet that solves it. And what I have found with any of these magical softwares that solve it, they solve it for now. Microsoft makes a change to the way they deploy something and everything falls apart again. The reality is, Microsoft trying to get better um, in their own way, and that's how these tools are always fighting against it. I've actually talked with the SolarWinds engineers. They're on it, um, but they, they're aware of all these problems. Now, we like the SolarWinds platform overall. Uh, in, for me, speaking to other vendors and whatnot, I really do seem to like their solution. But I'll admit I have not tried every single one of them. So before you leave a bunch of comments, what did we try first? Um, mostly I sat and reviewed with other MSPs. I looked at tools they were using ConnectWise and whatnot quite a while ago. I found them to be a little bit more complex and less uh, as complicated as this is. I thought some of them were more confusing to me. Uh, so I've settled on this. I'm not saying the other products are bad. This is a solution we know. And the pain of change will probably keep us here for a long time unless they do something disastrous or have some major security problem. And let's talk about security. We really are happy with the level of security they see they put together for SolarWinds. They have not had a major security incident. Uh, and I guarantee because of the scale and scope of their product base that they are being attacked heavily at the moment with ConnectWise. And I have called out other of these small uh, tooling companies that come out uh, with that had CVEs or had security issues. Matter of fact, I've done several videos on Kaseya and problems they've had. And I will call them out by name because they've had what appears to be either a bad actor or poor product quality causing breaches. So, and you can search Kaseya hack and you'll find videos on my channel about that and where I talk more in depth about it. So, let's get off those topics and say yes for Solar Winds. No, I haven't tried. Name the RMM tool and try to deploy it on every one of our clients and switch back and forth because I didn't got time for that. That's a lot of money out of pocket. SolarWinds is a very reasonable system, and this is what it looks like on the dashboard. Well, this is the demo dashboard. Normally, there's a whole big list of clients here, and it starts with uh, the companies, the, the company name. It's like our, this is, we call this one Lawrence Technologies Demo. Then we have the demo client, and then we have main for the main site. So the grouping starts with your company, and then you have the company name, you know, XYZ company that you're servicing. And if that company has more than one site, you can name each site. For example, we have clients that have multiple locations. We manage each of them and you want them grouped like this. So it makes it a little bit easier. Now, the good thing is you can ungroup them. You can say, I want to see all the computers. Like you start at the top at your company name and see every computer 
no matter what company they belong to. Now, this is how we deploy a lot of patches and things like that, but then you want to drill down and only see groups of computers in that particular client or even in that one location. You can pretty easily do that. So their menu is actually pretty easy to navigate. How did this tool get set up? Let's actually start there a little bit. So when you want to deploy agents, uh, we do it remotely. We don't always have to go on site to do it. So when we do a takeover for a client um, or we're setting up a new business and we're deploying our RMM tools, uh, you just download the agent. It's actually pretty slick. So you go over here and we're gonna download a site installation package. We'll go next, choose the demo, choose the site. There's only one in here, but there would be a whole list. You know, you choose the company you're gonna deploy it to, what site you're gonna deploy it to which agent you're gonna deploy. Uh, you can actually try beta versions. And sometimes beta versions have fixes in it that solve problems. It's rare we have to use it, but there's been like those one-off weird cases. Um, if there's a proxy server it has to use to get out, next. Then it gives you a group policy installer or a remote worker installer. And you know, it all depends on how you're gonna deploy it, but you can put this together and then deploy it out to an entire network. You can do a push. You can individually log into these computers. Uh, things you do have to make sure of before you get in there is that there's no other tools loaded on there um, and you have basically a clean install. Our perfect scenario is a brand new load of Windows that has nothing else loaded in terms of security software or antivirus um, and has not been online to get goofed up and has viruses on it. Is sometimes that some of the problems we have when we do takeovers is the cleanup work of getting off either old tools that are stuck in memory or weird things that they loaded um, or someone, you know, hacking around with it, playing with things. Those can be a little bit more headache to get the agent employee because it'll, it'll tell you why it failed or vaguely tell you why it failed occasionally because of some latent thing that was left on the computer. So if you Sometimes I uh, might have to do a little bit of cleanup when you're dealing with some of that. Uh, so cleaning the computers before you deploy it, way better. Just uninstall whatever one-off antivirus they have because there's more than I can name uh, in terms of different companies. Just get rid of them because you want to use what their product is. So for each client, we build a template. Or we, I should say we have a template that the admin, uh, happens to be me, uh, and one of my other staff have set up for all of our clients. But then we can customize that on an individual basis. Basically, there's like a global template. And that global template lets us choose things like the antivirus and uh, how some of the things are configured. So the, is the web protection turned on? Yes, it is. Manage antivirus, Bitdefender is what they're currently using here in March of 2019. Uh, manage antivirus is the old one. So they have two logos here, but it's because the old antivirus was the uh, Viper, I think it was. We moved everything over to Bitdefender and we're happy with it. Does it have the background installed? This is the remote background tool. These are to take control tools. <clears throat> and like I see, I know these are a little small to read and it, it, this format is cool, but it doesn't zoom in because the way it has like right click control and uh, able to do things with the workstation and the enhanced UI you're seeing here through a web interface, uh, it gets goofy if you try to zoom in and out. Sorry about that. But let's talk about what we can do here. So let's go ahead and edit this workstation give you a better view. So here is the general setting. <clears throat> remote access, by default we have it turned on. Remote background is on, patch management on based on policies. That's important because when we're handling patch management, the reality is all these computers are running Windows and we want them all patched. So that's where we start at that top view because we look at everybody's computer and we focus on patching everybody's computer. We don't go through and have to go make sure these clients are patched and those aren't unless there's some weird exception, uh, which is pretty rare you don't want to patch your computer. I really don't think we have any clients that are unpatched right now for any reasons. Now the web protection we turn on and then we have different policies or custom policies of strict um, or different things that we had configured for some clients. It, it, sometimes we've had a couple custom ones that we see in there. Backup and recovery. By default, this is off because we install this on an individual basis based on how we sold the client. But you can actually have it managed here. Um, you can see the backups from here as well as from the backup panel, so it's kind of nice. Once again, we're using the SolarWinds backup and the SolarWinds backup, the integration with that. Uh, use policy on, so this just has a little link that gets them to uh, our website if they need to. We have it at the bottom to show a little icon. Network discovery, alert routing. Um, we do have some alert policies. And whether or not there's any like critical event notices, like I said, there's different things there. And this is one that's turned on right now, but 
we actually turn it off because it's on a case by case basis. Now, the way SolarWinds pricing goes, I can't give you the details of their pricing. That is something between you and your sales rep, but they have a really simple pricing system where they include all the licenses in the tool price per workstation. Don't reach out to me for pricing. I don't have those answers. You get pricing based on scale. So my price may not be the same as yours, whatever. I'm not going to discuss the details of it, but they have a charge for each one of these things on here, like the risk intelligent reports, the web protection, and things like that. And you can work out a deal with your sales rep so you can bundle it all together. But this is actually one of the reasons I like Solar Winds is I don't have to acquire license externally or separate. It I turn these check boxes on. It gives me nice, clean price breakdowns per site, per client. And then from there, it's easy to understand how much money you're making in terms of what your tooling costs versus what you're charging the client. Now, when you're doing the MSP pricing, I will throw this out there, you need to have a pretty big gap between you, what your tooling is because it's actually not that expensive. I mean, it adds up. You see a big bill once you have a ton of computers on here. But um, that gap in between has to, one, be profitable for your company, two, cover all the labor, um, all the staff it takes to manage this because, like I said, if you're looking for an automated magic button that does all this, it doesn't exist. Uh, so that gap has to cover payroll has to cover this building, whatever marketing expenses you have and things to uh, acquire clients to use this system. Something to think about when you're doing the pricing. You just don't mark up the percentage off of this. It's everything else in between. But from a standpoint of selling it, we pretty much sell one MSP package because I think that's simple. I turn everything on and then the upsells are really just the risk intelligence. And I see that because when you're working with some of the manufacturing companies um, that only do B2B sales, uh, the risk intelligence is cool, but they don't have the same regulation of compliance. And I'll uh, cover what the risk intelligence is in a little bit. Now let's look at some of the more details of how the patches work. So here's your list of uh, things that when you're clicking on any one individual workstation, and this works for servers. I just don't have a demo server I set up. I only put one workstation in here. Let's go back over to it. Um, it will tell you when things were offline, online, when a service check was reached. These are the uh, tasks that get noted like, hey, this computer was offline. So, you, you know, obviously it's like anything. You want these computers online. Here are the checks that are run, and this is where you can add a specific check. You can customize them, you can write scripts, you can force something to be done here, you can put some special script that checks a special thing for a special client, and this can be customized on a per client basis. And then you can actually just force it to run these checks or edit the checks and then see the results of each of these to see what they were and then go from there on taking action on some of those checks if there's something you need to take action. Uh, no missing patches identified. These are just notices, hey, cool, we didn't find anything missing. That's a good thing. Then here's the task as well of what things are being done. Clean up. This is a temp cleanup on there. And you can build and add more automated tasks. For example, if you have some file you want compressed, have a folder you want compressed, uh, get map drives, get startup applications, remove, log me in, run that as a process because I'm going to try to install something on there, whatever. There's actually some cool things you can do here. And of course, these are more scalable. You can also, because of the way the remote background works on this, if you want to deploy a piece of software for a, a client because they have something they need to deploy across the works and you can use this to go out, download and grab it and put it together. It's actually a really nice feature to be able to have that. Patches and assets. So it's, here's how the patch management works. And this is where everyone gets angry because sometimes it doesn't install. Uh, here's a couple things I had ignored purposely, and we're going to go ahead and approve them. Approve. There we go. Now this is going to get installed, and it's kicked off on the patch. And you, this is I did this on purpose to set these up so you could try to see, like, I can approve or not approve patches. You can set these to auto-approve. I'm not going to get into every detail, but there's an entire approval policy system that you can get in here. And patches can be a headache. Please note, it did update things like Chrome as well. It doesn't just update Windows. It updates other applications it's aware of. You can have to contact other Wins for the full list. I'm not, I don't have time to cover all that in the scope of this video. Antivirus. Uh, any threats that are found as it does the scans are all right here. They're going to show up in the list so you can uh, find a threat, quarantine it, remove it, examine it further, um, and dig into a little more. 
web, here are the websites that this computer went to. And you can then dig into some of the categories. And I think I may have tested uh, a naughty website on here to see if it would block it, and it did. But it's a good way to kind of look at the different websites if this is something the management needs to know. Or if you uh, dig into it further, you can actually export this. And there's ways to even dig into like blocks that were done. So any of these reports can be expanded out. And that's why I skipped over assets. So here's the assets related to this particular one. But there's an entire asset tracking system in here. And this is kind of clever because a lot of people ask, well, how do you manage assets? Well, the nice thing is you can add you can manage them through here in an interesting way. It will summarize an entire company, all the sites under that company or just the one site, give you count of the computers, what version. It'll even dig into information about you know, what software is installed and how many count of there. So if you have you know 30 or 40 workstations, it'll summarize everything, break it all down, and then give you all that information on what's on each one. Can tell you what motherboard's on there. It'll tell you what BIOS version is on all there. Now, granted, this is a, a virtual machine. Our demo is. There's a lack of some of this information in this particular machine. You can look at how much memory's in them, cache memory, disk drive, etc. You kind of get the idea. So, you can also make reports based on this: SQL dumps, XML dump, client inventory reports. It, it goes on and on. Asset track at settings. And dig into it further because you want to track virtual machines you want to track more more in depth um like i said read through the documentation this is a very extensive program now let's do this i don't have netpath set up but what netpath does is sets basically a ping tool uh to allow you to see how the client sees a site so you set up a ping and, and a monitoring of it uh, so it monitors a certain site from your client's perspective. Maybe they have some online ERP software they're using. You can set up a monitor between their site and the ERP software because obviously if you can open this site, cool, but can they open this site? And what was the average ping time from their site, not from your site? And being able to track that statistically and see how the path goes is really cool. Um, that is an upsell and also a service fee to turn it on to have it constantly monitor and logging. This is just a filtered view, so you can go here and I quickly created this little test. And it allows you to kind of run this filter so you can group things differently. It's kind of cool. I don't use it much. My staff uh, probably does. But it allows you to, if you want to monitor something based on a certain specific criteria, uh, you can check these boxes and then narrow and filter things down. I actually like the dashboard view, and I can see a lot from here. Uh, looking at all the different things patches and things like that. I can see what's going on. And these turn red if something's wrong with there. All right, let's get into a little bit more detail. Remote access, for example. So the cool thing about remote access, we're just going to run the take control, launches from the browser here, and it's loaded. This is one of the reasons this demo is being done in Windows, because this software doesn't work in Linux. So don't ask. Um, I tried. It breaks. It, it's hacky. I, I don't. I run it in Windows. I have a Windows system here to be able to do this. Now the remote access is nice, um, lets me jump right in and get onto this computer, our demo computer, so we can start looking at what's going on with it. Also has a couple cool features. And please note, yes, the demo computer is not set to the same resolution as my screen, that's why it's kind of smaller, um, but it does have that support. It also has support for things like most uh, multiple monitors. So if there were multiple screens on this particular workstation, you could get into that. Um, it lets them know Remote desktops, Lawrence Systems, well, it lets you know which user. So it's RMM demo at lawrencesystems.com is in a session. So that's the demo user I have particularly set up for this. Um, it has full screen, and then you get these little pull downs always on top. Dark menus, which it has a dark theme. I like that. <laughs> Not everything has to be a light theme. Um, lets you do file transfer, send commands, show blank screen. And the most important and stupid one, but man, this gets used a lot. Lock remote keyboard and mouse. There's nothing quite like playing tug of war with a client. That's really aggravating to me. Um, so I don't want to fight them. I just do it. I don't tell them I'm doing it. They want to uh, go crazy on uh, fighting the other direction or what you want to click on. Uh, it also has a couple modes where you can just do things. It's got a laser pointer mode, things like that for the remote software. But it's interactions, take screenshot. Yeah, laser pointer. There we go. Here. Click here. Click here. Yes, we do that a lot too. So this just lets you help point. So when you're trying to train someone remotely, because um, they can never quite describe it the way you want. So a lot of times your take control sessions aren't necessary to fix something. It's to tell someone that they need to click the little button at the top. And yes, I know this 
version of Windows isn't activated. Uh, whenever we fork a VM, um, that happens. Just so you know, that VM forking causes uh, the system to break the license. But like I said, this is a demo, and that's how we set up the demos. Go ahead and close the session. Exit, take control session. Now I will note, when we go over here, I'm gonna run over to take control report. This is a compliance thing. I'm gonna run it for uh, just the demo client. Well, it all, doesn't matter, there's only one client in here. But please note how it says, all right, RMM demo, RMM demo, when it logged in. These are important things for compliance and there's a lot of reporting that goes on inside of the RMM tool because you need to know when someone says, did someone take control of my computer? You need to be able to answer that question um, definitively and reportedly. So each person has a user and you can go through and user audit report, notes report, device inventory, policy reports of how things are set up. These are really automate, important things. Automated task report, take control for patch management reports, failure reports. So you can go through and see what failed if you need all reporting. They give you a lot of tools. Um, they even have a report builder for the web protection. So you can say, Show me more details on this particular device and then generate these reports on here. And it downloaded this one to CSV. I think we can, yeah, we can, we can do an HTML report as well. And we can dig into that. And I could have pivoted it differently and said, okay, I want to see it like on an individual workstation. And we've had to work with our clients before because they want to know where their clients are going. This is one of the reasons the web protection software, one, is important for protection. Two, is important for uh, dealing with when you have those questions that come up a lot. And a lot of people, this is they're always asking me about dashboards and firewalls. The problem is the firewall without a certificate installed becomes very blind to a lot of the traffic. This tool is loaded on every workstation. Therefore, it gives us excellent visibility into everything that workstation did. Hence the reason when people ask me about setting up filtering on firewalls, I point towards our RMM tool. Now, other cool features, and I'm gonna combination this so you can see it better. So here is the remote here is the desktop and it's taking control second to launch here go to this pc take a look at the c drive funny i already have that file in there as i was playing with it so there's list.txt all right what if you wanted to not disrupt the user not remote control into this but get connected and do something from the command line Remote password, let me get the password to this and put it in. All right, here is the remote background. We are command line into this computer without user interaction. So there's that list.txt file. We're just gonna go. Over here, gone. This allows you to Go in the background, fix and open and close things that may be running. Um, actually, let's go ahead and open up Chrome, for example. So there's Google Chrome running on here. And this is what the user sees. The user doesn't see what you're doing here. Remote process control, image name, and process tree. Are you sure? Yep. Actually, I probably got to end all of them, don't I? There we go, we found the right one that was uh, the start of all that, but you can see how in the background here, it stopped Chrome from running. This is really nice because it allows you remote services. I can start and stop services running in the background. If I have to restart a printer service, I can control a lot of the back end without having to go into the system itself and disrupt the user. This is really important. This also allows you to do things like look at log files or run commands from the command line when you want to background install something. We've done this before to kick off things from the command line. There's a lot of command line options many programs have, whether you knew this or not, where you can simply pass the parameters along, kick it off so it runs in the background um, while the users are doing whatever without actually disrupting their workflow, which that's one of the reasons I like this tool a lot. We use this a ton and it um, nice thing is this does work in Linux because this is all browser based here. It's only the take control itself software that doesn't. And like I said, you don't have to have the take control software open to be able to run any of the remote commands or even you know do any of the remote control background services in there. Close all this. So that's kind of how the remote background works. Now, a few other things you can do on here. Now this is all the workstations normally listed here. Uh, you can do mobile device management. I don't have any of that set up for this particular demo. Network devices is kind of cool. 
if you want, you can set up to monitor some of the network devices via SNMP. They have only a limited amount on the list in there, but they do have the networks over here, which is a little bit different. Now, this particular demo machine is on our demo client network and slash client network where we have uh, computers that come in our store to get work done. And I tell it to go ahead and discover these and it will run around discovering all the little things like the test NAS, the Synology demos you may have seen. There's a test PF sense here. There's a Chromecast on this network. It can identify things plugged into the network and monitor them. This can be very handy for uh, notifying you or noticing uh, when there's different devices that you want to discover on the client network. What it does is the RMM tool itself that loads on any individual computer runs through and figures a lot of this out and gets all that details and goes, hey, here's all these devices I found on the network. Really handy because we'll, you have to find a printer when they go, hey, we just got this new, yeah, I found it printer. You can answer the question for the client. Yeah, I see a new Xerox printer was added to your network. Oh, how'd you know? So uh, this becomes very handy to go, okay, I found the address. I know it without even having to jump into the firewall or the um, DTP server and try to determine the new addresses that were added. It's always scanning and keeping an eye on things. And it can have a history of these devices of when they came and went. Because this was on the demo network, there's all kinds of things that keep coming and going. This will tell you which agent. The agents hold uh, a contest, I guess, if you will, to determine who will be the discovery agent. So they're not all just making a bunch of noise on a network. Uh, because they're all on the same site, it'll determine which one becomes it. So it, it'll say discovery agent. And you'll see all of them listed, and you'll see a promotion to which one was actually doing it. Now back over to some of the other reporting. So you can dig up threat reports for clients, antivirus protection, quarantine, patch management reports, uh, backup re recovery reports, web protection like we talked about. But risk intelligence is where it gets really cool. Now this is only for the clients that have compliance, but compliance is huge. So you need to know all these things, security trends, PCI baseline, data breach trends. Um, this will really help break down a lot of the reports. Now, this is another tool that you can add on there. We're actually going to go and look at the scan results directly for this device. This is a really great tool for um, when you're dealing with people who you, it's hard to keep track of. This is from not just from your perspective as an IT, but from the perspective of the client. How do I keep track of people who do things stupidly? And it's always found out after the fact. Well, hopefully not found out after the fact, after a breach, but you know this happens where someone saved a whole bunch of credit card numbers in a Word document and saved it to their desktop and not even on the server. So that becomes challenging. This is where the risk intelligence can really help. Data breach risk scans. The system will find an index on an individual workstation basis and give you these reports. The potential liability is kind of novel. What, what, what might it cost them? So you can actually give these reports to the client. It might have cost you this much if someone were to go there and do this. Number of security checks executed, 1,615 vulnerabilities details. It will find if they saved A, and that's what it's showing here, and good news is there's no unprotected data details. Uh, it will find a list of documents and tell you that these documents contained a bank, credit card, licenses, social security number. It's using just a partial to identify it, which also means uh, it has some false positives. Apparently, some license keys that someone had saved looked a lot like a license that it flagged as something else. So you can get them. That's why there's an exclusion list. So the first time you run this, uh, don't panic. There's going to be some things you'll find that may or may not be correct. And uh, you can then start creating filters for that. But it's a great interaction back and forth with the client. Um, one, you're protecting them and helping protect them from a future thing because you're constantly scanning. And then you'll find that one user, like I said, who for whatever reason thought saving credentials in a Word document was a good idea. And then you can explain to them why that's a horrible idea. Now that's a data breach risk. Let's talk about PCI compliance. And I think this particular uh, scan results, I think this machine failed. So let's dig into that. Yes, it failed. It's completely patched. So we are running the patch management, but it does have some compliance here set up to fail. And I already know why. If you notice when I logged right into the computer, what did I do? I didn't enter a password. So I already know that's probably the first thing on the list. Uh, verify that host has personal firewalls, automated test result, compliant, compliant. Where's the fail? Not compliant. Minimum password length. Yeah, the password length was none. So right there is your uh, password complexity and password length uh, automated test. There's the failures of why this is not in compliant. And what's the other one? 
uh, verify the host history password in a password policy. So we failed on all those. So other than that, it's patched and everything else. Once again, this first page right here, easy to talk to a client. It's a good talking point. You can create summaries of this and say, hey, this particular person does not meet the requirements for that. And that's why we turn on risk intelligence. But like I said, we're turning it on, on, on a, a per client basis, whether or not they even have any of that. Because some clients are like, we don't um, we don't have to comply. We don't have a credit card machine. We don't do credit card processing. We're a B2B company. It's still sometimes a good talking point because they shouldn't have banking details saved in there. Uh, but it can be a little bit of a harder upsell for some of them on there. And there is a cost uh, to have that risk intelligence, both in the fact that it's running on those computers, scanning these documents. You set the scan times, but the it, it, it does have the cost monetarily too through the RMM's uh, platform. Now, one of the last things I'll talk about here because um, like I said, I could go on about any one thing and dive really deep like to the script manager, how you write scripts. There's so many facets because this is a complicated thing, but I will talk a little bit about the um, client reports. There's a lot of people have asked me about this too. You have the executive summary report, client workstation reports. I think there's, uh, well, it's not enabled. I think I can do a sample report. So let me see here. Okay, here's the example report because this demo hasn't been on long enough to do the monthly reports and things like that. And I want to address that because I think it looks cool and you can fill this out for the company name and make it all fancy and pretty looking and give them a health score to let them know how much you patched and things like that. And they're kind of cool talking points when you want to have a conversation with a client. Um, they do have the ability to like automatically send these to your client, but I will tell you uh, it has been in my experience and myself as a business owner, as not just an IT business owner, but just a business owner in general, we are slammed with lots of people trying to express how they're creating value for you. Uh, don't bombard them with this. These are great talking points when you want to have assessments with the clients and they want to know. Um, but just automatically emailing these without explaining or having sit downs with the client, it, you just are creating more noise for them. But it does do this for you. It can show how many alerts you resolve for that particular client. And it's not that you really should have to spend too much time, but there's sometimes uh, bean counters who go, what is it that you do and why do we write you this check every month or every six months or however you're uh, billing yourself with that client. So it is nice that it does have all these built in. We don't ever automatically just bombard our clients with them. Zero of our clients have ever asked to be automatically sent a bunch of reports on things. I think they're always better with a sit down explanation when you want to review things with a client, uh, but it does have all that built in. There's so many reportings on both the you know, server-side monitoring, client monthly reports, weekly reports, workstation monitoring reports, daily, weekly. You can really bombard yourself with reports and bury yourself in a lot of confusion. I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> um, one last thing you can do is the wall chart here. I'll cover this last. Um, you can go through and say, um, open a new window. There's actually no reports in here. That's a way we can filter it. Yeah, it only shows when there's problems. You can create like a wall report and project it out to a different monitor, maybe drag it over to another screen um, in your knock area or however you want to do that if this matters to you. And it allows you to only show the problem workstations. And that's actually how we focus on things ourselves. Uh, we filter for only the problem workstations because those are the ones you work on. And that's why when I say we, the way we handle it, we start here at the top. We only want to focus on all the workstations and all the workstations are having problems. That's what we do to make sure that they're doing things right, um, that there's not a problem with those right there. And hey, look, uh, while we were doing this, and I know the time's wrong on the computer, that's why it has the wrong time there versus the time here. Um, cumulative update for Windows 10 that just got installed. That's that patch that we did. And now it's installed on that particular workstation. You can, if you have to, put the workstation or schedule a reboot and then schedule it at a certain time. Yeah, so uh, let's go over here to yeah. reboot. You can set now, later, you can set a scheduled time when you want to do it. But reboot later, this is one of those you have to uh, interact with the client. What time do you want to reboot it? Pick a time, set it. Now you can have that computer reboot without you doing it. And you can let the client know uh, because when you get busy during the day and you have to do a bunch of these things or you know a, a system needs a reboot, you message the client, find a time. Or if you already have it in your agreement, I do recommend this. Say, hey, we can reboot your computers anytime after whatever hours they are closed. Um, that's a pain for our, some of our clients are 24 hours because they don't have a specific time. Uh, but for a lot of clients, you know what time they're closed and we let them know, please save and close all your applications because we may have to reboot computers based on needing to update this, that, and another. Like I said, this is a pretty big overview. I could spend forever going into every little detail of every little thing, but this is, uh, 
you know, kind of give you an idea of solar winds. We're happy with it. Um, nothing's perfect. I said that at the beginning. I'm not going to reiterate that. So all of them always have some level of issue that you're going to deal with. But um, it works pretty well, and we manage quite a few clients with it, and it does maintain uh, things. It makes it a lot easier than trying to do all this by hand, and it's a pretty nice system. All right, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.